So like Adam said, I'm here to talk to you today about jQuery, which seems somewhat silly at a jQuery conference, but jQuery has really been getting a lot of flack in the web development world lately. Let me switch my slides. And you've seen a lot of blog posts, a lot of uh, social media and such that's saying jQuery is too big, that um, we don't really need jQuery anymore. And just two weeks ago, somebody created you might not need jQuery.com, which was kind of hitting at these same points. And the thing is, um, from a lot of these, these posts and these, the social media and such, they, they have a good point. jQuery really isn't for everyone. If you are building something very simple, if you just have a single button or two and you need some JavaScript, you should really take the time to figure out how those native APIs work because it's really not worth adding a library just to do that. And on the flip side, if you're building a distributable library, if you're building something like a plugin or something you tend to distribute within a company or an organization or the internet or whatever, you should definitely take the time to really think about whether you're gaining enough from jQuery in order to use it. Um, nobody likes to see the jQuery plugins that are just appending things to the jQuery namespace and not actually using jQuery at all. But I think the point here is, is that the, those two categories apply to such a small subset of developers. Most people aren't building things that just need one or two pieces of JavaScript, and most people are building apps or things for clients or companies and aren't really building things that they're going to distribute to large numbers of people. And a number of people from the community have stepped in to kind of defend jQuery in this space. Rick Waldron put together a pretty epic list of well over 100 bugs that jQuery still works around for you in modern browsers. And it's a pretty impressive list to look through. And John David Dalton and Paul Irish actually put together this Google Docs that builds upon that and talks about some of the other things jQuery does for you. And to me, well, those list of browser bugs is pretty impressive and all the things that jQuery still does. There's really a larger point here. And to me, it's that jQuery does a whole lot more for you than just work around these browser issues. And that's where the title of this talk comes in. And I use the word browser utopia to refer to a hypothetical world where we have all these features implemented and there are no more bugs in any of these browsers. Now, we'll never really quite get to that point, but the browser landscape is way nicer today than it was back in 2006 when jQuery first came out. At that time, we were dealing with IE6, with Firefox 1.5, with Safari 2. And if you look at the modern browser landscape, what we have today is, is pretty utopian compared to what we have there. So the points I'm going to try to make today are, one, that jQuery is worth using even if it didn't do all these things to work around these browser bugs for you, and that jQuery is still relevant for the vast majority of applications. Now, before I get into that, I, I have to make a few disclaimers. And the first of which is I am on the jQuery team. I work mostly on jQuery UI, but I also work on several of the other jQuery projects. And I'm also currently writing a book on jQuery UI. So because of that, I definitely have a somewhat of a vested interest in the success of jQuery. But at the same time, working on the team and working in that environment, I also spend a lot of my time working with the DOM, working with these native APIs in an environment where there are no abstractions. And because of that, I have a far greater respect for what things like jQuery, these libraries, or really any library that helps you out with the DOM does for you. And so to kind of try to prove those points, I'm going to walk through what I think are the main three arguments that people have against jQuery. And by anti-jQuery, I just mean arguments that jQuery is no longer relevant today. And those are API parity, basically saying that now the DOM APIs and these native APIs now do everything that jQuery does and that you don't no longer need jQuery's APIs. The second is that jQuery is just too big, that the, the file size, including it on mobile, it, it's just too much of an overhead and it slows down performance on mobile devices, um, that sort of thing. And then the last thing I'm going to get to into is performance, just that jQuery is too slow. And I'm going to start with the API parity. And there, there's some truth to the fact that the DOM APIs are better. We can do things with the DOM 4 spec has methods that were inspired by jQuery, things like remove, after, before, things that are way more sensical than the things that we're doing today. But the thing is, there's still all sorts of problems with these DOM APIs. Oop. Continue to the internet. Okay. 
But the DOM APIs are still kind of a mess. They're still really verbose, they're not easy to use, and there's lots of gotchas in there, even in the very most modern browsers, the most modern spec'd out stuff. So I'm gonna talk about some of the verbosity issues first. And I'm gonna start with a very simple example, something that's pretty common. You just wanna add a class name to all the paragraphs on the page. And when jQuery, this is pretty simple. You select your paragraphs, you call the add class method, you get your class name. Now if we try to replicate this using the DOM APIs, this would be a decent attempt. The, the class list API is um, a new API that was, I don't remember what DOM spec it was a part of, but it gives you nice means of managing class names. You have add, remove, toggle methods, things that were also somewhat inspired by jQuery. But there's a problem with this example in that this calls query selector all, which finds all the paragraphs in the DOM, but the problem is, Query selector all is a list of nodes. It is not a single node, so therefore it doesn't have a class list property. So this example also doesn't work. And if we look at this example, our next step would be, oh, okay, well, query selector all returns a list of nodes, so I just have to loop over all of these, and then I'll add that class name there. I'll do a quick loop. But the problem here is that query selector all actually doesn't return an array. It returns what's known as a node list. Therefore, you can't call the traditional array methods that you would expect to work. Um, instead, you have to do one of two sort of convoluted things. You either have to store off a reference to it and do what I like to think of as an old school for loop over these elements and call class list on that. Or you can do something where you, oops. or you do something where you create your own abstraction. You, um, this find method approach here, it uses array prototype slice essentially just to create a new actual array so that when you call query selector all, it'll return the node list. Calling slice will turn that into an actual array. And then you can call for each on that and loop over it. And it's not just the fact that these APIs are verbose and kind of tricky to use. There's also lots of gotchas in there. And I'll show this first one. Um, take a minute to look at this and see if you can figure out what gets logged here. So, I think most people, when they look at this, when you see first child, you would kind of expect that that paragraph be logged. You get a reference to the div and then you just get a reference to the first child. But what's actually getting logged is this white space node right here, because the white space is relevant in the DOM. So this actually logs that. And there's an alternative reference, first element child, that you have to use that's gonna give you what you want. It ignores actual white space nodes. And it's one of those weird things that can accidentally bite you in production, depending on whether you're using something to strip white space or whether you just happen to put white space in there. And it's just one of those really tricky, quirky APIs that shipped in the DOM and that we're stuck with till the end of time. Um, a couple of the other ones I have in here are related to query selector all. And um, take a minute to look at this and see if you can figure out what this is gonna do. If coming from a jQuery perspective, if you look at this example, you'd probably think that this would log the paragraph. You get a reference to the div with query selector, and then you do a query selector all on that div to find the greater than, so the immediate child, that are paragraphs. And you would kind of expect hello world to be logged here. But the thing is, this actually throws a syntax error, because query selector all actually can't handle what are known as leading combinators, which are these three symbols here, greater than, plus, and tilde, the two sibling selectors. And it kind of comes down to a fundamental difference in how query selector all and jQuery selector engines actually work. And I have one more example to show this. So here, it, this is a similar example, the same markup, and it's also getting a reference to the div, but this time doing a query selector all to find all, all elements within that div that match the div p selector. Now again, coming from jQuery, you would expect this again this, would, this one would log nothing, right? Because you would expect, oh, you're within the div, and then you get a reference to additional divs that have a paragraph. But the thing is, this actually logs that paragraph. And it's because the way query selector all works is very counterintuitive. It actually takes the selector that you give it, regardless of the context, runs that selector against the root of the document. So in this case, it'll say, in my entire document, how many paragraphs do I have that are within a div, wherever, of that result set, it then runs, it loops over the children element of the context, in this case, the div. So in this case, it says, find all paragraphs within the div in this entire document, store that reference, and because the div is the context, which elements are within that div? 
And in this case, the paragraph meets that criteria, so it is logged. And it's not just jQuery, but basically every JavaScript selector engine doesn't work this way, and it's pretty counterintuitive and something that can catch you by surprise. And there's actually quite a few more than I have time to go over. The, the jQuery core team created this, um, this lightweight alternative to Sizzle that just very lightly wraps query selector all for use in jQuery. And you'll see this is actually from the, the code. There's this giant comment block in the beginning that mentions some of the things we just talked about, but some of the other things that you give up as soon as you make the transition over to query selector all. And the crazy thing here is that these examples are not bugs. These are things that are actually part of the specification. And this goes into kind of the limitations of the, the web platform itself in that once some of this behavior ships and it gets out in the wild, we can't really get rid of it. So when these APIs that clearly have issues come out, there's really nothing that we can do about it. And some people make the, the counter argument to this is that, well, we're all using jQuery, so we're kind of sheltered from having to deal with this. If we were to use these native APIs more, we would know about these things, um, we would deal with them, we would learn them, that sort of thing. And there is some truth to that. We would get green gator no a better knowledge of how these quirks work. But at the same time, jQuery's APIs are just easier to write code in because you just don't have to worry about any of this stuff. And it's beyond just writing the code. I mean, when you're using an abstraction like this, you don't have to worry about the tests because you can rely on jQuery to have this test suite. The, it's gonna be easier to maintain, refactor, all of these good things, even to Google to find issues if you're running into it. So basically in general, the, the DOM is still a mess. It's better and it's getting better all the time with some of these new APIs, but there's lots of edge cases, more than I even have time to get into. But even if all of this, it, even if all of this is true and you believe that jQuery is the answer to this, the, the next argument is that jQuery is just too big. And you see this sort of thing a lot, um, especially in the context of mobile, that jQuery is just too big of a file. And if you look at jQuery core's file size right now, uh, the 1x branch is at some, somewhere around 32K and some, and some change after it's minified and gzipped. And the 2.x branch is, is 28K and some change gzipped. And the thing is, most people seem to think that that's an acceptable size for desktop browsers, for desktop connections. But the question really comes, is that too big for mobile devices? And to answer that question, we kind of have to get into how the browser actually interprets script tags. When the browser encounters this tags, tag, it's gonna do two things. The first thing it has to do is it actually has to go get that script. It has to either go across the network to contact some external server to get it, or it gets it from the cache, maybe um, from uh, the disk. And then it actually has to take that file, since JavaScript is an interpreted language, and actually go through the steps to parse it and get it ready to run. Now, I'd like to talk about each of these separately because they each have their own considerations. Now, the, we'll start with the download, just actually getting the script from the network. And I have two statistics up here, and one is what's known as an RTT time, so the round trip time, the amount of time it takes from your computer, your machine, whatever initiates the request, to actually contact some external server, wherever it might be on the internet. And on desktop browsers, that time is usually a matter of a few milliseconds if you're on a, a fast broadband connection. And some crazy modern connections can get like one millisecond or really low. But on mobile, this is actually kind of a big problem. The, the data I have up there is about a year and a half old now, but in 2012, it took about an average of 300 some milliseconds to make each and every one of those round trips. And I think that data is down to like 200 milliseconds on average. LTE networks um, promise something like 100 millisecond round trip times. And to contrast that, mobile download speeds, while not great if you think about uh, in terms of desktop browsing, like getting one to two megs per second download, download speeds is not bad. And if you think about that in the context of web apps, if your web page is one meg and your average person, even on a crappy mobile, mobile network, is getting one to two megs a second, your web page should, in that case, download in less than a second. But we all know that isn't true, and the limitation in the vast majority of situations ends up being those round trips. So for most of the time, reducing round trips is gonna be substantially more important to the performance of your applications, especially on mobile, than reducing the actual number of bytes that you send across the network. 
And because of the reducing HTTP requests and reducing round trips is frequently listed at the top of most performance best practices, Google's, and I have Yahoo's pictured up there. So the next question is, what does that have to do in the context of jQuery? Well, the main thing it means is you want to reduce HTTP requests. So if you're concerned about the performance of your application, it makes sense to reduce those by connect concatenating your scripts together. Instead of serving jQuery in a separate file from your application, use some build step, any build step you'd like, to go ahead and concatenate those two files together. That way when the browser encounters this, instead of making two separate HTTP requests, it only has to make one. Um, the next thing, kind of the, the logical conclusion of this, is it really, for most apps, does not make sense to use jQuery from a third party CDN. And this is even more true of libraries built on top of jQuery, jQuery UI, jQuery mobile. Because in addition to the extra round trip that we just discussed, when you're using a CDN, there's some additional cost baked in there. Uh, the, when the browser encounters this, first of all, when it sees ajax.googleapis.com, the browser might need to do a DNS lookup to actually convert that domain name into an IP address so it knows where to contact. And the second is, because it's using an additional domain, it actually has to establish a different TCP connection to actually go and perform that HTTP request to get the script. So you have the potential for not only one, but three additional round trips when you use a CDN. And the off-sited benefit of the CDN is that, well, but you might not have to do any because the user might come to your site cat with, with the resource already cached. But in reality, it's extremely rare for you to get cache hits from these third-party CDNs. The main reason is you have to match on an entire URL for the browser to cache. Any difference in the URL, and the browser will think it is a completely different resource. And that means your URL has to be the same in terms of the same CDN provider, whether it's Google, Microsoft, jQuery, or there's several other CDNs. Also, HTTP versus HTTPS, and version number as well. And you're only going to have that resource cached if somebody has visited a site that you've matched on all three of these criteria for the URL to be exactly the same. And especially version number, I have version numbers up there. Um, that data is from March of 2013. And in March of 2013, the most common version of jQuery served was 1.4.2. So there's obviously some great variety in what people are doing with these CDNs. So I would argue that for the most point, most part, the download portion of jQuery is a bottleneck for almost no applications. As long as you're concatenating and minifying your scripts, sending an extra 28K across the wire um, is almost never actually going to be a bottleneck. But there's a different part of this story, and it comes to the actual parsing and execution of scripts. And what I mean by this is when the browser gets that actual JavaScript file as text, it has to take that and make it into something that it can actually run. And there's a multi-step process to this. It has to take that text and turn it into bytes and do some things that I don't even totally understand in order to get it ready for execution. So what I did, I wanted to get an idea of, well, how long does this process actually take? And what I did is I just made a very simple, simple case here because I wanted to take the network out of the equation. And I just started a timer, just threw jQuery's entire minified scripts in there, just verbatim, spit them out, and then stop the timer, just to get an idea of how long is it actually going to take these browsers to parse this. And I have the results up here. And what I found was kind of interesting. It, the desktop browser is kind of as expected, handle this pretty quick. Um, the 15 milliseconds, I mean, these are blinks of an eye that even if you had a, a whole ton of script tags, these aren't things that you're going to typically notice. But on mobile devices, the story is a little bit different. And if you look at the most recent versions of like iOS, Safari, and Chrome for Android, they can handle this parsing task fairly, fairly decently. I mean, 50 milliseconds, when you compare that to, say, the round trip times we were looking at earlier, it's pretty reasonable for a script tag to get through it. But I think the real dog here is when you look at some of the data from some of the older Android devices, and I had test cases where I pulled out the crappiest of my old phones, and it might take a, up to a second, and even on some feature phones, more than that just to parse jQuery. And, in my opinion, this is the thing that has given jQuery and really any JavaScript library of any size kind of its bad rap for mobile devices. Because these old, these old phones, these old devices are really bad at getting through and parsing big JavaScript libraries. But 
there is a silver lining here. Um, one of it is be Moore's Law, and that these devices and these, um, the, the browsers themselves and the hardware themselves are going to gradually get better at doing this sort of thing. And we can see this in the data itself. We can see the improvement across Android. And I ran across some older data. Stoyan Stefanov had actually done tests similar to this on iOS 5 and was having jQuery being parsed in about 200 milliseconds or so, roughly. And you can see they've got that data there, that number down to something like 40, 50 milliseconds. So these devices are constantly getting better. But again here, there, there's really a, a bigger point. Um, well, I should say before that, that if, if this is a problem for you, like if you're, if you're actually targeting these old devices and performance is incredibly critical, um, jQuery Core now has full AMD support. Um, Timmy Willison from the Core team is going to be giving a talk on that, I think, later today, either today or tomorrow. So you can get into including just the parts you need. Um, jQuery Mobile, Kendo UI, some of these libraries built on top have full AMD support, and jQuery UI has, will have full AMD support in its next release. So you can use that to exclude the things you need. But I think the more important piece here is that there are far more important things for most applications. The average website now is over 1.7 megs, which is just enormous. Um, and at 28K, jQuery core is just a tiny fraction of this. So for most apps, you have bigger things to worry about first. Um, if you're already minifying all your assets, concatenating all your assets, making sure you're gzipping them, setting all your appropriate cache headers, removing all your extra unnecessary HTTP requests, because all of those are also round trips, all these images and stuff, if you do all those things, and you're still seeing performance issues, then you can look into something like jQuery Core's a and support, trying to really get down, micromanage your bytes and such. And then even if you get to that point, then that would be the point where you might want to start looking into something like using native methods. But for the vast majority of, the, of applications that are out there today, this really isn't a problem. So the other thing related, um, the last thing I want to talk about that I want to make sure I get through is, is the performance aspect of it. And the, the size was kind of, kind of played into this. That was more the, the load time size of jQuery. And I want to get into just the sheer speed of jQuery, the, how long it takes to select elements, how long it takes to show hide elements, that sort of thing. And one of the blog posts that I, that I referenced earlier has a quote in here that I just like to read verbatim. And it says that, remember, jQuery is an amazing library that makes all of our lives easier. But you should always choose to use native DOM methods if they are available to you. And I actually take a lot of issue with this, this quote, because first of all, always is a really hard word to use in any sort of development material, because it almost always depends on the development situation. But I'd like to counter this and say that native methods, sure, they're almost always going to be faster than using jQuery's methods. But the thing is, in the overwhelming majority of situations, it's just not going to matter. Um, and there's tons of JS person analysis of this sort of thing online. I ran my own just really quick, and I just wanted to select three list items, a pretty simple task. And I wrote one that used jQuery and one that used query selector all. And if you look in the box, you can see that, yep, query selector all actually performed this task 3.5% faster. So it is a faster method. But the more important thing to look at here is just the sheer number of times the browser was actually able to perform this task in, in a second. Query selector all ran 478,000 times, whereas jQuery ran a measly 425,000 times. Now, if you're developing something akin to a physics engine that for some reason needs the DOM, uh, maybe that 3% is going to matter for you. But for the vast majority of situations, you might want to question why you're trying to query the DOM several hundred thousand times in a second. And uh, Dave Methvin actually used this quote earlier today, but I'm going to use it as well. It's a very famous quote that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And almost always, it almost never makes sense to worry about the performance of your application until you're detecting issues with the performance of your application. Um, Dave even had a slide in there that said, I mean, fixing performance issues is a two-part thing. You notice the issues and you fix them. And Dave actually went into some of the techniques that you can use to do that. And there's some real-world examples of this. The people at Trello did a, a big blog series post about some of the things they did to speed up Trello. And it's a really interesting blog post that talks through some of the best practices and such. 
But in there, they talked a little bit about one of the things they tried to do was switch from the jQuery methods to kind of their native DOM equivalents to get some performance benefits. But the, the thing is, um, they noticed that it made actually no real world difference in how Trello performed. So they just didn't do it. And something a lot of people might not realize is that jQuery is already optimizing a lot of your code for you. If you look at, I have a little um, pseudo code kind of from, from Sizzle, jQuery selector engine, and internally there's already been research done to figure out what are the most common things that people actually select with jQuery. And this code has been optimized so that those code, those code paths are, are hot and easy exits. So the first thing that Sizzle checks is, did you actually pass me an ID selector? Because that's the most common thing that people do with jQuery. And if so, it checks that right away and exits right away. And there's several other checks. It's not just Sizzle. It's really throughout the jQuery library. It's, it's heavily used and it's been tested against these situations to find what people do the most and speed them up. And the last thing I want to say is, remember that jQuery is not forcing you to use all of jQuery. It's, it's actually one of the reasons that jQuery doesn't provide a jQuery object as this in a lot of its methods, things like each and event handlers and such. So if you want to use these native methods, if you do your profiling or whatever it is you do and you say like, oh, that actually is slow there, then just go ahead and use the native methods there. And you don't have to give up all of jQuery to do that. You can just use the native methods where it makes sense for you to do so. So to wrap up, I guess um, the, I, the three main points that I think people had against uh, jQuery were things like the, the API is pretty much the same and um, it might be too big for mobile and um, the performance isn't there. And I hope I countered that by, by saying that jQuery does a whole lot more than just work around these browser bugs. It's going to do a lot more for you. It's going to provide these APIs that are easy to use, that are battle tested, that are just help you build apps. Um, but like any library, I mean, you shouldn't use jQuery just because the internet told you to do so. But you also shouldn't do it just because the internet told you not to do it. Um, I mean, in the software industry world, we all here are paid to make software. That is what we do. And honestly, if jQuery makes it easier for you to do it and you're not noticing any issues with it, then go ahead and continue to use it. Um, jQuery's motto is, is never been more true. Write less, do more. So thanks. <laughs>